Hello and welcome to the IEA's YouTube channel. I'm Annabelle Denham, I'm Director of Communications at the IEA. Before introducing my guests, let me first encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and thank all our donors who make it possible for us to put out daily content for free. It has been claimed by some that in a decade's time, cash will be a thing of the past. Some see this as an opportunity and not only for well-off early adopters, Thanks to open banking and forward-thinking fintechs, they say, we can all reap the benefits of a cashless future. But others have expressed concerns that the war on cash is being waged by vested interests, that it threatens to undermine our privacy by allowing spending to be tracked. We should, they say, fight back and keep using cash. I'm delighted to be joined today by Kevin Dowd, Professor of Economics and Finance at Durham University, and by Sam Dimitriou, Research Director at the Entrepreneurs' Network. Today, there are 500 billion banknotes and trillions of coins in circulation. According to a recent report from G4S, which manages cash distribution systems, physical money now accounts for 9.6% of GDP, up from 8.1% in 2011. A trendy London cafe is one thing, but surely concerns over a completely cashless economy are overblown. Kevin, I'll come to you first. Well, okay, so what we're saying we are saying is a spike in demand for cash just at the moment. And we saw this before with Y2K and with the global financial crisis. So that kind of illustrates that cash is a safety asset um, that we go to in times when we are basically frightened. Um, the other point I would, I would kind of make is that uh, you can't um, infer a great deal from the short-term uh, demand for cash. You, know, you certainly can't infer that it's uh, in long-term decline or terminal decline. Uh, we just don't know the future. Sam, what are your thoughts on this? Because um, Fred de Fossard, who wrote the Entrepreneurs Network report cashing out earlier this year, has said that it's not inconceivable that we will have a cashless society in the next decade. Well, I think it depends what's meant by cashless so if 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 it's a world where banknotes just aren't even printed uh complete complete end of cash i don't think that will happen but if it's in terms where the average person might go weeks on end without spending money through anything but but their card uh, and that increasingly many shops will only accept card payment then i think that is a reasonable possibility. So if you look at um, so if you look at some of the changes in in usage, so um, about half of Britons only carry less than ten pounds on them at any one time. Uh, only a quarter of retail payments are made in cash, and you see across the high street, cash points are disappearing, and we're also seeing. Uh, sort of rise of the cashless business. So, um, give you an example. Um, if you, there's a coffee shop down the road from me, uh, and you cannot pay in cash there, and they implemented that as at a lot of businesses because handling cash comes with its uh, comes with a few negative side effects. First one is uh, if you hold cash on your premises. Uh, it's much more attractive for thieves. And if you're publicly saying you're not holding any cash on premises, it means that both you're less likely to be burgled and you're also less likely to pay quite a lot in insurance premiums. Uh, the other thing is that for very small businesses, handling cash can be quite expensive in terms of just uh, regular trips to the bank, paying in, managing, managing money in that sense, which perhaps aren't as much of a concern for larger firms. Can I come in there? I mean, I think, uh, Sam, the, the issue is that cash is good for some things and not so good for others. So you have a, a universe of, me, of media of payment um, and they all have their different, like, let's say, niche uses. And so um, what, in terms of policy, there's the question of whether the government should be tilting, that the state should be tilting the field for or against cash. And my view would be that the state should be completely neutral. If cash disappears naturally, then fair enough. Um, so the state shouldn't be trying to get rid of cash and it shouldn't be trying to defend cash, nor should it be promoting digital or any alternatives to cash. 
the level playing field is exactly a level playing field, you see. So um, what, what kind of bothers me a little bit about some of the discussions that we see recently is that w w that kind of starting point has not been properly addressed, mm -hmm. like a principles based approach. And secondly, you've got to look at the costs and benefits of particular media of exchange on particular media of payment. You see, so from my point of view, if cash disappears naturally, then I have no problem. I mean, I'll miss it a bit, but I don't have a policy problem. Um, but if cash is, is driven out because it's prohibited by, uh, by the state, then I've got a serious issue with that. And, and therefore, any discussion of cash really needs them to go to the, to the potential benefits, the niche roles that cash plays relative to other media of payment. Sam, yeah. could I just turn to you and ask you to respond to Kevin, but also to perhaps um, give our viewers um, a bit of background on what the UK government's current attitude is towards cashless businesses? Yeah, yeah so, so I suspect we have a lot of common ground here. So we're both free market people who don't want to stand in the way of the market outcome. Uh, what individuals freely choose is ultimately what should stand. I guess where we differ is perhaps in emphasis of where we're concerned on the policy front. So I think there are a lot of market forces shifting the UK to a mostly cashless economy. My concern is that some politicians uh, want to sort of force cash upon people. So I'll give you an example in the US, uh, uh, lots of cities, so San Francisco, uh, home of probably the leading payments companies in the world um i think i think some i think seattle as well and i think mm. portland have uh banned businesses from uh going cash free so it's illegal in those places to as a cafe or something to only accept card payment now i think that has a real negative impact on smaller businesses because uh first of all it means uh, they have to store cash and if consumers are increasingly moving away from cash because payments are much easier to make now, you know, you can just tap your watch against a, a pad, you don't have to get anything out of your wallet or anything like that. If that's the case, then they're going to be burden carrying a disproportionate cost from having cash on the premises because it'll be an increasingly small part of the business. So I'm quite concerned about that. Now the argument for, for these sort of measures and it's been advanced in the UK by something called the access to cash review which is uh, funded by which was sort of funded by the largest uh, ATM manufacturers yeah. who obviously have their own interest in yeah. in this issue but uh, I believe it, I think it was pretty independent other than that uh, and that looked at the issue of people who are financially excluded so people who don't have bank accounts um, and looked at why they weren't able to, uh, what, what the consequences of a move to a cashless society would be for them. And looking at countries like Sweden, where consumers sort of adopted cashless very, very, very quickly, people were very happy with card payments. And I think, I think the, the, the sort of big tipping point came when you couldn't pay for the bus uh, using uh, cash payments, and that's because, um, the union of uh, bus drivers uh, was, were tired of getting robbed. Uh, yes. which is, so, and so that led to sort of a tipping point of people switching mostly to car payments. So I think the concern here is that the, the sort of forces are gonna sort of impose sort of similar bans as you see in the States well, on, car, I, on card only businesses. And I think that would be a real concern for me. Sam, I agree with you on that. I mean, I do not support tilting the playing field via state power against uh, digital alternatives to cash. That's a, da a dangerous principle to endorse. Um, so we're on the same side exactly on that issue. Where I, I think I differ slightly, maybe, is that I, I don't support the countermeasures that promote um, uh, digital alternatives to cash via any form of state power. If it is the case, that the technology people push for digital alternatives and they gradually drive cash out or reduce its share, then that the market share, that, that, that's fine. But I'm also a little bit wary when we talk about uh, partial cashlessness and so forth. I mean, you either, a fully cashless economy has no cash. Okay, mm. so um, then the question is whether that would arise naturally or whether it arises through some, let's say, 
more, more uh, dodgy, uh, the misuse of state power, basically. So therefore, I would say that since we agree that we don't want to drive out the digital, then the question is, what are the, what are the niche roles of cash which are unique to cash or close to unique to cash? And that's where perhaps I would take the discussion. So what have we got? You've got financial privacy, number one. That's important. Uh, you've got monetary inclusion. People talk about financial inclusion, but monetary inclusion being a part of the monetary economy is even more basic. If, I'm, if, I, if I don't have a bank account and I can't use cash, then what am I in, in terms of, I'm outside the monetary economy. And that is catastrophically uh, bad for, the, for those people. And there are a lot of them potentially at risk. So that's the second point. And we've got the unreliability of digital that your service provider can, uh, your, your, your provider can screw up. It's happened to all of us at some point, I think. Then you've got the question of what happens if the grid goes down. If you like, have a situation like what happened in Puerto Rico a couple of years ago with Hurricane Maria, and the Fed had to fly in a plane load of cash because that's all, that's all the money that could be used at the time. There was no grid. And then you've also I got ask the, you to come back on some of those points. You know, the privacy concern issue. Do you think that that's overhyped? Do you harbour concerns about financial inclusion? How could those be overcome? And what about you know some of the technical issues with the digital uh, economy, cashless economy? Yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm probably not not going to lose sleep over sort of the grid going down in the UK because I think it seems as if it's robust enough although we've obviously seen things go very very wrong in a short period of time so um but but i i, I do think in general that those those concerns are more relevant outside the uk uh in less stable regimes so i mean what one good use of cash uh is that if you look in the developing world, uh, lots of countries, it's very easy to be expropriated your wealth. And cash is a good way of keeping that out of the hands of uh, governments that sort of enjoy looting the population from time to time, uh, especially uh, rivals to the government in terms of their political views. So um, things like being able to have a hundred, uh, $50 bill or able to have a 500 euro note in those places is very valuable. So there is certainly a purpose there, although it's less of a function, I would say in, in the US or the UK or the EU, um, it's almost like a form of foreign aid that we create these very safe stores of value for people who are sort of political dissidents or uh, business people who are operating in these sort of really uh, dangerous regimes. So that, that I think is quite a useful feature of cash. Um, I think in terms of privacy, there are obviously ways to be private in a digital world. So you have things like cryptocurrencies, but you also have, uh, you know, there, there are ways of uh, hiding your transactions. If you can use gift cards, for instance, uh, which, is, which is limited, you can't, you can't necessarily use an Amazon gift card for, every, for anything, but you can trade that with other people for other things. You can create a sort of shadow economy for, in that sense. So there are still ways of achieving financial privacy. On the financial inclusion point, I think that's quite important. And looking at sort of both how you improve financial inclusion, because um, some of the problems seem to be a lack of satisfaction with the existing products of the banking system. So one of the good things with fintech is that we're seeing uh, services designed for people who wouldn't traditionally use uh, uh, a normal bank account. So one of, one of the key concerns is, and I think that's changed due to regulation recently, but was very, very large overdraft fees catching a lot of people out. So a lot of the people who are classified as financially excluded at one point did have a bank account and got rid of it for, for those reasons. Uh, another thing would be making it a lot easier to register for a bank account. So I think something the post office is doing is making it so you can have uh, a post a postbox address 
instead of your home address to get a bank account. So things like that, I think, uh, and, and that's been sort of in collaboration with some fintechs, things like that can reduce the burden of financial uh, or you said monetary exclusion, but I think I think we're using the term to mean the same thing. No, we're not. So can I just say, yeah, monetary inclusion is like the absolutely fundamental um, idea that you are part of the monetary economy. So these are the people who are hanging on, the beggars on the street who have got drug problems and so forth, who haven't got bank accounts, don't know, haven't got a mobile phone, they haven't got anything, and they want to be able to go into a shop and buy a cup of coffee or something like that then the financial inclusion is, is like a higher ideal. Um, and obviously everybody, I think, is in favour of that, where we're talking about people who, who are, are not as poorly off as the person who's hanging on to the monetary economy. But one thing that bothers me about the, the, the people who say that we should promote financial inclusion by, digital, um, by promoting digital is the, is the danger that if that proposal or they make a proposal that says we should get rid of cash then you've automatically thrown the people at the lowest rung of the ladder into into uh, essentially uh, barter and and that point is not addressed enough of course i think that more can be done by the industry uh, and also actually by by the state by deregulation to promote um um, all forms of financial inclusion. So, for example, uh, private banknotes would be a solution, or script money. Or so I know script money has a bad reputation, but a lot of it's undeserved. So, so the, 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 if, if the only role for the state is to get out of the way, and the state is meddling way too much, is what I would say. Um, can I also go back to privacy? Mm. It's you can there are degrees of privacy that you can get from crypto or bitcoin or whatever but they're imperfect and so that if i want to make a small transaction that i don't want somebody looking over my shoulder about the transaction whatever that is cash is often ideal um and also can i say that you mentioned amazon gift vouchers i was going to mention them too that that's much better than using cash for crime purposes you see, so the you know the smart criminal these days doesn't use doesn't make much use of cash to do illegal transactions. They use gift vouchers if they're on a small scale, or they use banks or accounting firms if they're on a massive scale. Like, uh, for example, um, the Dansky Bank um, scandal, where a quarter of a billion, a quarter of a trillion was transferred through the banking system. So we haven't got to the to the criminal side of it, but I've, I've brought it there. Um, so. Um, I think there are a lot of different issues here that are rolling together, but I think if we, if we go back to the, to the privacy issue, I would say that there are certain transactions for which cash is the ideal transaction, including from a privacy point of view. And to go back to your point, Annabelle, if I, the, the key issue is the right to privacy. Now, I will often engage in transactions where I am prepared to allow somebody like my bank to monitor what I'm doing because of the convenience of it. But that's because I choose to do that. So that's the key issue is the right to privacy, not whether a transaction is, pri is, is being monitored or approved. Mm. It's, the, it's, the, it's where the right goes. So if you get rid of cash, then uh, you are seriously, um, potentially fatally compromising financial privacy. Because Bitcoin and crypto is, is extremely difficult to use. And also um, it, it's, it's far more, uh, let's say, open in terms of being able to track people down than people think. So if you're a real crypto fanatic who is really high tech and knows what you're doing, you can disguise your transactions to a very high degree. But if you're the average person on, who pays in Bitcoin, you are much more exposed than you think. Sam, do you want to come back on that point on you know, privacy for the average person? Well, I, I mean, I guess this goes back to the... Uh, I mean, on the one hand, you have the question of should the go should the government or should the government should the government or shouldn't the government tip the scales in favour of cashless? Uh, but you also have on sort of the other side, you have the the tr how is this trend going to play out, and will will it be that cash will become something that's become something like maybe one percent or two percent of all transactions, something that's very uncommon. Uh, and isn't really supported by infrastructure, because you could have, you could very well have a situation where 
uh, large retailer. So I believe there's a Tesco, maybe in Marks and Spencer's in Covent Garden, that doesn't accept uh, cash payments. So you can have very, very large uh, uh, shops adopting cashless. And I guess, and then you come, and then I think it comes back to sort of people's uh, own sort of value of privacy rather than the, the right. So how much, did, how much weight do they put on a transaction being private? And so I suspect if you look at a lot of what people do on, on the internet, for instance, with the social media, with their choice of search engine or whatever, they waive certain amounts of privacy in return for convenience. And I'd, I'd, and I'd expect a similar thing to happen uh, with consumers in terms of uh, card payments. I don't think many people are too concerned about their card payments being tracked. Now, obviously, there are a certain group of people, for sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons, are concerned about that. Um, but in general, you could move to a situation where it's possible to make private transactions in cash, but the payments infrastructure isn't there. So you can only maybe interact with a third of the economy in that case. So that, that, I think that's something worth considering because then even though you have your right to privacy with cash, it, it's not a right that's that useful in that sense because you can't, let's say, you know, be paid in cash and then choose to spend all your money at the supermarket if the supermarket doesn't accept cash for instance so, um, go for it kevin sorry, so some i agree with that and i think that the hard um the hard case is where you, you're talking about say a village where there's only one or two shops so there's no cash point machine and stuff like mm -hmm. that those are the difficult cases and so the question is and, and, and one can't deny that those are huge problems and i think we saw similar issues in sweden you know where 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 there was still a, a small cash economy, um, and and it was struggling at the margins. Um, but then I think the answer to that is I think to deregulate, because if the demand for let's say I want cash for certain transactions, um, or let's say that the demand for cash exists, then the supply will follow if the as, as long as the state doesn't stamp out the ability of the market to respond to that demand, you see. So it doesn't matter how small that demand is. If it's there, the market will satisfy it, and even on a very local level. So it's not necessarily, although obviously you think about uh, the big infrastructure issues, they are relevant, obviously. But, but if you take sort of some small village out in the back of nowhere and so forth, and there are still these old people who are addicted to cash, and so forth, then I'm sure that the market will provide a local solution. And that's what you find, for example, when you look at the history of script money in the United States. So the market will solve the problem if it's allowed to do so. I'm not saying it's not a problem. Mm. Yeah. And Sam, do you share Kevin's concerns around uh, the crime issue? I know that you've suggested that it's beneficial to small businesses because, you know, petty thieves or some such like might be less will be won't be able won't have a cash register um to rob but what about you know the more sophisticated bigger crime organizations they've moved to digital um is that you know you're concerned about that i think i think probably less i think cash does make life slightly more convenient probably for some criminals um I mean, uh, but is it worth getting rid of cash in order to prevent, you know, drug dealers laundering, you know, millions? Probably not going to do that much. There's, you know, you, you, if you've watched something like The Wire, you'll see the extent they go to just to keep their phone calls private, you know, over sort of three seasons from burner phones to bleepers and using paper, all sorts of different things to stay one step ahead. I think that's probably what you'd get if you try to eliminate cash in that sense for, for that for that aim so i'm not i'm not in favor of that i i guess my concern with crime is always the the fact that if you possess cash you become more of a target um and if the payoff to committing a criminal act is lower uh then it does make a real difference in terms of uh 
the risk that you'll be a victim of crime. So one, so one example is uh, it's, it's become a lot harder to break into cars. So we've seen a large decline in car theft because mm. a lot of the time it's just not worth it to try and break into a car. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I don't know how effective uh, touch ID is at uh, getting, making sure that your phone isn't worth stealing. I think there's still ways around that sort of hard wiping the, the software. But, you know, if, for instance, all you have is a phone where you can't use it to spend money and perhaps you can make it disabled, then all of a sudden there, there might be less risk of certain crimes as well. So I think that, that the move to cashless will probably be generally a good thing in terms of crime. But obviously you have the other way of crime that perhaps isn't the scene. So you've got cyber crime where people's yeah. whether potentially you could have your life savings taken from you through it through identity but i think that's we're getting better at stopping that but it's that is the different concern okay so, two points. so yeah. I, please do yeah, i mean as you, you mentioned um, um sam several times about this idea that uh, if you carry cash around you're more likely to be robbed well therefore the rational person wouldn't carry cash around and they'd look for some alternatives and the, the solution that is being uh, is coming out from the market is forms of um, either alternatives to cash or uh, else uh, more security if you do use cash. I mean, you mentioned the, the thing about the Stockholm bus drivers. And I, I'm immediately suspicious when it's a trade union that is promoting uh, some innovation. But um, surely the solution would be some sort of strong box in the, bo in, in the, in the buses that uh, provide some protection. Um, you know, for the driver, it's that kind of solution. It doesn't necessarily involve not using cash, but it's all part and parcel of the process of development where, where technology changes and, and so forth. So if you, if you feel vulnerable, you wouldn't go around with a bag load of, of cash. Mm -hmm. It's not a policy issue. Yeah, exactly. We're, I think we both agreed that the sort of, the, the, the role of government isn't to pick a side yeah. It's to allow market forces to interact and let consumers decide because ultimately consumers will have more information about the usage of cash or the value of contactless. I mean, so I'm sure some of the argument, some of the benefits of contactless probably haven't been spotted by people advocating abolish, abolishing cash, for instance. So, you know, people, people in, we, we had one example in the report of a, of a craft beer tap room that was able to operate sort of very, very far off the high street. So in sort of warehouse. Now venues like that, if you've got cash on the premises, potentially at a high risk of theft mm. uh, and high risk of sort of a stick up because you don't have uh, you don't have the same ability to, you know, have a police officer come very quickly and you don't have lots of eyewitnesses in the same way. So venues like that, for instance, suddenly different parts of land has become useful again for retail so there's lots of different ways that uh these lots of different information on the ground that wouldn't immediately be picked up by a policymaker, and that's why it's not a good idea to try and tilt the market in any one direction yeah and what about what's happening currently i don't always want to peg things on the coronavirus crisis but Financial exclusion is a persistent problem in the UK. You've got 1.23 million adults who don't have access to a fully functional bank account. Kevin, you've raised concerns as well about monetary exclusion. And here we are with many outlets, or at least the ones that have been allowed to stay open, not accepting cash at all. So sort of two questions to you both. First, um, you know, what's happening at the moment in terms of exclusion? Um, and second, what impact do you think that the coronavirus will have on potentially accelerating this pre-existing trend towards a cashless society? Um, I guess I guess it's a slightly different issue in terms of policy because coronavirus, unlike um, say the other issues with cash or the other reasons to favour cash, it it's something that's that has externalities, something that has effects on other people. So what's individually rational might not necessarily be uh, optimal for society. So you know it might be your personal risk might be very low, but you might be at risk of harming someone else. Uh, and that's kind of the general 
uh, justification for the sort of very big sort of restrictions on our liberty that we've had to endure recently. Now, with, with something like contactless, again, it's, it's weighing up whether it's worth it to prevent the risk of people spreading it through, through you know, through surfaces. Um, now, I'm pretty sceptical that cash is a, is a big vector for disease uh, in this sense, because I think most people at Tills have got their hands covered and uh, wearing gloves. And I, and I don't think it actually lasts on surfaces for that long or not in that much of a dose. I think you're more worried speaking to the cashier. So if, if I think probably the benefit would be if you're not talking to the cashier for as long because you're just tapping it, then that's probably more likely to stop you from spreading it than the other way around. But, but yeah, I think the fact that some shops will have gone contact card payment only if they haven't experienced the drop in demand they expected or they've been trading okay throughout the lockdown, so, so as shops have sort of started to reopen, they might decide afterwards that this is something worth doing in the long run. So there, there's a lot of things where we don't know, but we don't usually run the experiment. So we're sort of running an experiment for lots of places. It's a bit like um, during... Uh, uh, during a tube strike, people tend to vary their routes. Yeah. And there was a study that said about 20% of people keep their new route yeah. uh, once the tube strike is over. So it might be like one of those cases where people would pick up on new ways of doing things and realise it's more efficient for their business. So, Sam, I think that's exactly right. Um, but it, it's not just one experiment. It's like a whole bundle of experiments. Mm -hmm. Once, let's say, we return to normality, I'm sure we will find that our habits have changed, including our usage of cash to some extent. And if shops find that they, the customers are comfortable or have become comfortable uh, using digital, then that's fine. But I mean, you raised the issue, I think it's Annabelle, about, about health, right? So um, and I, I noticed it was in, in the, uh, the report that you did, Sam, or that Fred did, um, this idea that uh, cash was unhealthy. And then uh, I'm not aware of a single case where somebody's got ill through the use of cash. That's number one. And leaving aside coronavirus. Um, there's also the issue of whether plastic is safe. Well, my understanding, I'm not an expert on this, is that people sometimes use plastic for very dubious purposes, like going into the washrooms and fiddling with and, and using it to, to, to move powder that they stick up their nose and things like that. I think, so, I think there is a bit of cash involved in that process as well. well the cash as well, yes, I stand corrected on that. But, but the other point is if cash is so unhealthy, why do governments or central banks create so much of it? Well, I, th I think the issue with cash in terms of hygiene and health hmm. is an issue in, say, uh, street food stands, for instance. So it might be the case that you handle meat with a glove, but you don't want to then touch cash with that. So you might either need a separate person handling the till, or you might have to take your gloves off, put the money in, and then put them back on. So I think yeah. that's the concern in terms of that. So it, it creates a sort of friction. And I think if I mean, and I think that's one of the reasons why some people in food stands, for instance, have welcomed the move to contactless because they don't have that extra hand over cost, which maybe adds 10 seconds to, to the process. And if you've got yeah. a very big long queue, it might mean that certain customers just stay away. So I think that that's the other. It's not necessarily saying people are, well, I think probably because people have already changed their behavior, people aren't getting a £10 note and then catching salmonella off it. Mm. Uh, but they might but if they be take the in the first place, I suppose. So that, I guess that's the issue. Yeah. I mean, my point was simply this, that number one, you see these scare articles that say the vast numbers of uh, salmonella uh, colonies on a single like, five pound note or something like that. But uh, fair enough, uh, it's easy to, to scare people, but how many people have actually got ill? And, and the, 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 the common sense, uh, solution is simply to wash your hands more or perhaps mm -hmm. to wear gloves or whatever and if as you say if if it's too uh, transactions intensive um, to do it in a meat store then then go digital thank you for watching this video and thank you to sam and kevin for taking part please do subscribe to our youtube channel and hit the notification bell to ensure you never miss an episode
Lastly, any donation, however big or small, is greatly appreciated so we can continue to put out free daily content.